Greetings from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, we thank you for joining us in midsummer for another virtual program from the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, today, virtual voices of the game dealing with the subjects of baseball and art, more specifically the artwork of the legendary artist Norman Rockwell. Uh, we'll be talking momentarily to Stephen Harrison of the Munson Williams Proctor Arts Institute in Utica, New York. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Bruce Markson. I work for the Education Department uh, here at the Baseball Hall of Fame. We present these virtual programs throughout the year. And today we're going to have uh, some fun talking about some terrific American artwork. Um, it has me feeling nostalgic as I look back at um, a number of these pieces done by one of my favorite painters, uh, the great Norman Rockwell. Uh, joining us to talk in depth about Norman Rockwell, to talk about the new exhibit that is featured at Munson Williams Proctor, uh, Stephen Harrison, who is the chief curator. Just to give you a little background on Steve before we officially bring him on. Uh, he was previously a curator at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, he has also worked as a curator at museums around the country, Atlanta, Dallas, New Orleans, one of my favorite towns and previously was a faculty member at Southern Methodist University and the University of North Texas. We welcome to Virtual Voices of the Game with the Baseball Hall of Fame, Stephen Harrison. Stephen, welcome. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much, Bruce. It's my pleasure. Stephen, before we talk about uh, the exhibit, I thought we'd briefly mention how you came to Utica. You've been uh, at a number of large cities, major museums, but I guess it was just a couple of years ago that you decided to make the move to central New York. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, it was really the, the collection at the Munson Williams Proctor that drew me to this wonderful arts um, institution and the, the fact that there's a school of art connected to it as well and, uh, and a performing arts series. So it, uh, it was a chance to work in a, a very lively and dynamic uh, institution within a wonderful, beautiful region, which includes uh, the great uh, Hall of Fame in, in Cooperstown, as well as the Fenimore Art Museum there. So it's really a, a wonderfully culturally rich area. And I was so happy to uh, make the transition from uh, the city to the, to the country, so to speak. And we really enjoy the benefits in the spring and summer. Winter takes some hardiness, but uh, spring and summer, really beautiful time and fall as well here. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about the exhibit. Here is a screenshot of your webpage, uh, mwpai.org. So that's the official website for the Munson Williams Proctor Arts Institute. The exhibit, which is simply titled Norman Rockwell, opened back on June 11th. It will continue for another full month until September the 18th. There are guided tours of this exhibit offered on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Uh, those are done at one o'clock in the afternoon. This extensive exhibit features more than 50 original artworks. Also, I know a lot of people, including myself, really like this, all 323 of these Saturday Evening Post covers Right. That Norman Rockwell did art for are featured uh, in this exhibit as well. Uh, did I miss anything? Any other details you want to pass along on the exhibit, Stephen, before we start delving into some of this artwork? Well, we also have a, a wonderful area of interactives for both uh, visitors young and old and, uh, and a pop-up shop at the end, uh, which is open on the weekends. Um, where you can indulge yourself in all sorts of Norman Rockwell merchandise. And during the week, uh, we sell that merchandise also in our museum shop on the ground floor. But uh, uh, on the weekends, we uh, bring the, the merch to the visitor upstairs. Stephen, what are your regular hours there, both during the week and on the weekends? We're open 10 to 5, Tuesday through Sunday. Uh, well, Tuesday through Saturday, excuse me, and then noon to five on Sunday. Uh, we close on Mondays, like many museums, in order to uh, sweep the floors and get everything nice again. All right, very good. 
So we're going to look at some of the, uh, the pieces done by uh, this man, the great Norman Rockwell, 1894, 1978. Uh, this is a great piece of art of him. Uh, yes. He was someone that, I guess, more than any other American artist during the 20th century, seemed to be able to capture American popular culture, Americana, if you will. What is it about Norman Rockwell that you in particular like when you look at his art? I think it's uh, really this incredible ability that he had to capture um, personalities and, and characteristics of people uh, that um, really brought their, their um, you know, their personality to life, if you will. And uh, um, he, he is clever in every one of his paintings. You know, there's, there's a story that uh, he wants you to uh, delve into and figure out, um, sometimes uh, very whimsical, uh, often quite whimsical, other times poignant. And uh, his career really was very extensive and he painted right up until his death in the, the um, mid late 70s when he died in 78. And uh, so he left an enormous body of work. And this exhibition uh, was designed, was curated to show really the breadth and depth of his work from uh, his earliest years to the latest. And that's why we just titled it Norman Rockwell because it covers all of the periods of his career. Obviously Rockwell was a fan of the game. But would it be fair to say that he was a, a rabid fan, a diehard fan? <laughs> a super fan, they say today. Well, I mean, uh, I think, you know, in, in many ways, uh, baseball comes of age in the 20th century, and so was, was Rockwell's work. And uh, as it was gaining in popularity, um, he, you know, Rockwell's work was as well. And so he painted a lot of baseball uh, related themes. We'll be looking at quite a few of them today. And uh, that's more than he did of anything else, really. Um, you know, he, he often, uh, he, he kept, um, he would serialize and he would bring characters back. But, um, you know, they were always in different situations and in different, different motifs. With baseball, it seems that he you know, really he painted it quite a bit, uh, painted yeah. themes from baseball quite a bit. It was America's pastime. And as he was a, a, a chronicler of American life, uh, he couldn't help but uh, be a super fan of it. I'm hardly an expert on Rockwell, but I don't recall seeing much in the way of, of football art that he did, basketball right. art. There may have been a few, but a I few. haven't seen many of a them. Few. Yes, that's yeah. right. Absolutely. Baseball was probably the sport that he turned to most often. A number of his images have become iconic, both in terms of, of showing family settings, showing important historical moments, but also a number of his baseball images have remained lasting as well. Mm. Why do you think it is that his baseball images stay with us, seem relevant today? I think um, Rockwell's imagery really... Um, tugged at the heartstrings. And we'll talk a little bit about this when we look at um, a few of the pictures that you've chosen uh, to, to discuss today. Um, he had this ability to really connect the viewer with the scene that he's painting. Uh, whether you were a part of it or not, he draws you in. And so his works really stay with you. And once you've seen it, you'll never forget it. And I think that's really a, a characteristic and a quality of, of his work that, uh, is almost unlike any other artist working in his time. We're going to look at several of his famous baseball pieces, baseball related pieces. We're going to begin with this one, which is not currently on exhibit here at the Hall of Fame, but it is in our collection. It was painted in 1939, the year the Hall of Fame officially opened. I believe that uh, this uh, was uh, first published, if you will, uh, uh, in July, which was about a month after the birth of the Hall of Fame, June 12th of 1939. Now at the time, there was a pretty universal belief that it was the 100th anniversary of baseball. We now know <laughs> that that's really not the case. Uh, right. So he did this piece. Um, it is uh, interesting in a lot of ways. 
It's got the, the stark white background. Uh, you can also see, it's, although it's somewhat faint, uh, it says 100th year of baseball. And then you have this uh, kind of crazy juxtaposition of the pitcher with the long legs and the umpire with a cigar in his mouth. Uh, so it makes it somewhat of an unusual, almost a comic piece. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this. What was Rockwell's influence and, and what do you think of when you see it? Well, um, it has several characteristics that are um, noticeable of, his, of Rockwell's work from this period. Um, one being the sort of caricature quality of of um, the, the the figures themselves. In other words, he's 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 exaggerated them. He's exaggerated the positioning, uh, the perspective. Uh, you know, he's he's layered them. Th these are all things that he devices that he uses in his painting, particularly to the up to the Second World War, um, which added a sort of um, almost cartoon quality, and. Uh, uh, Certainly in this early period of his career, uh, Rockwell referred to himself as an illustrator uh, rather than as an artist. And he was pretty adamant about that and would tell people, I'm not an artist, I'm an illustrator. But in fact, he's using a very sophisticated artistic techniques to um, create these works. It, uh, another one that he used, and you can see this with uh, works for the Saturday Evening Post, is he would often layer the figures over any text that was in the um, in the frame, not such that you couldn't read it, but uh, he made his figures all, always more prominent than the text itself. So um, often the the figures would would be layered over the masthead, the Saturday Evening Post masthead, and so you wouldn't see but uh, a little bit of the Post's masthead, but you knew what the magazine was. So. Um, I don't know. It's 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 uh, this kind of sort of whimsical, uh, glib uh, view that uh, he really tried to portray. Though I will say, here's the clever part. There's always a little turn to his works, and in this one in particular, uh, yes, that's the picture in front winding up. And in fact, the alternate title for this painting is the wind up. Uh, but the um, the umpire is looking dead ahead without a mask on <laughs> so you know uh, it's almost as if the 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 umpire is about to get walloped by the ball you know so there you are that's sort of what uh most baseball players thought of the umpires at the time yeah interesting that he puts a cigar in the mouth yeah. of the umpire and yeah. the umpire's eyes are, are bulging looks a little bit like the actor red buttons who right I don't, exactly. I don't think was prominent at this point he would come around later uh but uh, as you say it is somewhat of a caricature of an umpire even more so than the player right and um rockwell really began uh his work um grew up with those who were cartoonists as well um you know uh, everyone looked to find the serial cartoons every that was the first thing people went to often in the newspapers you know and to follow their characters you know and um uh, rockwell learned and studied under uh, important uh, cartoonists of his day so uh, while he wasn't a cartoonist he certainly uh, appreciated their sensibilities and their motifs that that helped get you know, ironic situations uh, and comic situations over to the visitor and to the viewer, rather. Stephen, many of the backgrounds to his paintings are, are natural settings. Here he goes for something uh, different. Uh, the stark white, it's, it's abstract. Any thoughts on why he might have done that? That was very much uh, the, the look of the Saturday Evening Post um, up until the Second World War. They uh, had a sort of cream colored background and uh, while I don't know this for certain, I'm almost positive uh, to answer your question, it was probably an editorial decision. He worked very closely with the editors at the Post on his paintings. They would, um, you know, and his images, which, you know, his painting would then ultimately be turned into a lithographic image that would be printed. And so they were, I think, concerned about um, the figures being in high contrast to the background. 
And that was very typical of magazine aesthetics in the, the first half of the 20th century. Were most of his pieces for the Saturday Evening Post, were they designed specifically for that? Or were yes. they sometimes already existing pieces that the Post felt, hey, that's going to suit what we want to do? No, they were always, his work, he was very much a dedicated commercial artist. And his work was done in conjunction with the editors. And uh, he, he might, you know, have suggested a, a, the subject matter. Uh, it might have started with him, but you know his um, his imagery was always um, guided by the editorial decisions of the of the of the magazine, and uh, so um, the the ones for the Post were done for the Post. He did three hundred twenty three, which is right. <laughs> a stunning number when you consider the the high quality, not, not just quantity, but the quality of the work here, uh, pretty amazing. What was, for, for some of our younger viewers, and even for someone like me, I mean, I've seen some of the Saturday Evening Post uh, magazines, uh, but for those who are not familiar with this publication, what was its general tone? What was its target audience? What kinds of articles and images did they typically tend to use? It was a magazine that, um, you know, first of all, it came, it was a weekly. It was um, a magazine that people very much looked forward to. Uh, there were others, the Reader's Digest, um, you know, Life Magazine, uh, later, um, later Look Magazine. You know, they were, um, magazine culture was, was a much greater, it's almost, it's almost gone now, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, but those serial magazines that you subscribe to were very much a part of the culture in the mid 20th century. Um, it really exploded in the 20s. And, and, uh, and for many in the 30s, a magazine like the Saturday Evening Post elevated your life and took you out of the day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, uh, dreariness of the, of the Great Depression. And... Uh, and the Post really wanted to promote um, a sense of optimism and hope. They were known as a, a, a more conservative magazine. And so they really wanted to downplay the nation's ills and uh, keep everyone thinking that prosperity is just around the corner, as Hoover had once said. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the tone was always upbeat and Rockwell could easily do that. You know, he was, uh, he specialized in very intimate situations, intimate and portraying, you know, relationships between brothers, sisters, parents, children, uh, old and young, uh, you know, but he, he uh, really specialized in people and animals and he loved putting them in various situations. I'm trying to remember when the the post went out of business, but I guess what oh, I'm it's still at, it's still publishing. Oh, it's still published, really. It's still published, yes. Oh, interesting. Um, yes. And it's still uh, it's still a magazine format, not just online. That's correct. Really? Mm -hmm. Did he do uh, post covers right up until his death in '78? No, no. He had a 47 year career with the post, which ended a, rather abruptly in 1963. He um, he began to be increasingly bothered by the editorial constraints of the Post. Mm. Uh, as I said, they were a rather conservative magazine, uh, at least in those days, and uh, they would not allow him to portray Black people in any other way than as servants, um, you know, as porters on the train or maids in the house. And, uh, you know, he just, he'd had enough of that sort of, um, uh, well, constrained. And so uh, he left the, the post abruptly in 1963 and, um, and began to work more for the more progressive magazine, Look Magazine. Um, and, and they gave him pretty much free reign to paint whatever he wanted to paint. Uh, we'll talk about that a li little bit later, but, um, you know, that couldn't have been an easy decision for uh, Rockwell to leave. He wasn't fired. It's just that that he just didn't want to work for them anymore. 
Yeah. And after 47 years, you know, and had made his career, um, that couldn't have been an easy decision. Sure. When we talk about his baseball images, this might be his most famous work. It's, it has multiple titles. I've seen at least three titles. We have two of them here. Right. A game called Because of Rain, also parenthetically known as the Three Umpires. Right. Uh, was created by Rockwell in 1948. It is currently here at the museum and it is prominently displayed in our art gallery, which is on the first floor. The three umpires that you see very prominent toward the, the, the foreground are Larry Getz, Beans Reardon, and Lou Jorda. And then off to the side, we see just a sliver of Brooklyn coach Clyde Sukforth, a guy who was legendary in baseball because he was the man assigned to scout Jackie Robinson for the Dodgers. And then on the right, we see Pirates manager Billy Meyer. Stephen, why do you think game because of Game Called Because of Rain has become so iconic, so popular, so symbolic of his baseball work. Well, uh, number one, it's filled with people and details. Uh, the, as um, his work after the Second World War became much more detailed and more realistic. And uh, so, you know, he paints an, um, a lot of figures, not, no longer do we see one or two but a whole raft of people. Um, they're often in the corners or there are details about the scoreboard, you know? And so it was a painting that uh, could pack a punch. And that was really important for the magazine. They wanted uh, something that told a story. And uh, so a picture like this certainly does, you know, it, it, you have, you know, it, it encapsulates the whole history of that game, which was, I suppose, you know, one that was uh, called because of rain. And uh, so, you know, that's what made Rockwell's works um, just highly anticipated every week uh, that he was going to be on the on the cover. He didn't produce a cover every week. He would do about eight to 10 every year. And so whenever his covers came out, they were filled with information and and people loved them for that reason. And just to underscore a point you made a moment ago, this was an actual game. This uh, was an actual scenario that developed in a game between the Dodgers and the Pirates. In particular, I love the expression on the home plate umpire. Right. He puts his hand out, he's got the water coming down, and he looks about as annoyed as you could possibly be. <laughs> well, you know, and I like to call this Rockwell's work artistic journalism because it's, it, he, it is, uh, you know, it's depicting a real game, but he didn't go to that game. Mm. He went to Ebbets Field after that game and took photographs of uh, umpires and he knew what happened and he placed them in this situation and used models. And, uh, you know, he recreated the scene of, of but it wasn't, he didn't take a photograph of that moment and then just go home and paint it. Mm. He put it all together, knowing what he knew about what happened then at that game. And for any other situation, it was exactly the same. He used photography to, uh, and models to help him um, put them in just the right places to make a point. And that's what he's doing here. Now you see Sukforth and Meyer off to the right of the painting. Is the interpretation that they're arguing about the, the weather, arguing about the forecast? I think they're arguing about whether the game should be called or not. Okay. One, and I think that's to do with, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, with the, the scoreboard and whether which team was uh, winning at the time they were about to call the game. Yeah. And uh, then there's also this, I've, I have read about this and doing a little research before our talk today that. Um, it's the score shows one team winning, um, but that's not the one who's happy about the game being called. And I think it's because they changed the score at the end of the full inning, not uh, during the, the half or something like that. So yeah. um, baseball aficionados will know uh, the reasons one has a frown, one doesn't. Yeah. Um, 
that it does pertain to the score, apparently. You know, while the umpires and, and the coaches and the managers dominate our view here, you pointed out about the scoreboard. There's also the advertisement in the background. I think those right. details really kind of make this painting. Oh, truly. And also, there's another, the, another very, very important element that's uh, related to Rockwell's artistic interpretation. And that is, he has foregrounded the umpires, unsung heroes of the game not the players in this one. And he would often do things like that. He would often reverse um, your uh, conventional thinking. Uh, and, you know, you and I might paint this game and we would paint the players or the coaches or whatever, but he turns it around and he uh, portrays the umpires because they're the ones with the tough decision to make. Yeah. I think it's also interesting the way that they're dressed. The umpire's uniform of the time was very formal, like a dark suit. Right. When you take the caps off of these guys, uh, it almost looks, this will sound a bit weird, but it almost looks like three men working in a funeral parlor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know enough about the, uh, the change, the history of umpire uniforms to, to be able to enlighten you on that one. Yeah. I mean, it's it's accurate. It's what it's what their uniform looked like back then. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the black of their of their outfits of their suits really really does kind of dominate. Well, their uh, calls right. were foreboding. You know, they they had they had the game in their hands. You know, yeah, that's true. I'm curious about the titling of works of art. This is one of many Rockwell pieces that has multiple titles. Why does that happen? Did artists typically not give titles? Did they leave that up to other people? Did the Saturday Evening Post come up with titles? Why do we have such confusion about what the actual piece should be called? Uh, well, I'm, I'm certain again, that has to do with uh, the editorial uh, decisions. And so uh, as he was passing this back and forth, the draw his various drawings um, with his editors, you know, they had to have a, a job title. And uh, so he titled his works. A lot of artists didn't title their works, but um, he always did. And I think the fact that it has several titles is a function of, you know, really how it came to be known, how it's known in the public, uh, you know, when it was reprinted or republished, that sort of thing. And incidentally, the third title is often a tough call. Mm -hmm. So... You're right. It, it, it's confusing. If you were to reference this in a, in a scholarly work, which title would you use? Which title <laughs> do you think is best? I would probably, I would probably use Three Umpires. Three Umpires, yeah. I think that is the, I think that's the accepted formal title. Let's talk about some other pieces that, that are not here in Cooperstown, but uh, very prominent pieces, some of which are at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, mm. But this is another favorite. This is the dugout. It was Truly. done in 1948. So it was done the same year as the three umpires. Mm -hmm. And here it doesn't depict a winning team, but rather a struggling team, the 1948 Chicago Cubs. Their record was 64, 90, and one. They had one tie. <laughs> they finished dead last in the National League. The other Chicago team fared worse. The White Sox were 51, 101, and two. They had two ties. They were last in the American League. Why do you think Rockwell gives us kind of this downtrodden theme here with this 1948 piece? Well, it, there again, he's, he's turned uh, convention on its head. And so rather than depict the winning team of that year, he wants to depict the lovable losers. And, uh, and I think that's because, you know, in, a, in, a, in, in something like this, uh, there's more drama, there's more personality, there's more character in someone displaying emotion that's not happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the face is distorted. In fact, this young man who was um, uh, in, in reality, he was a bat boy for the Boston Braves. This is this was done um, uh, after a, a, a baseball game that was the Boston versus uh, Chicago Cubs. And the Cubs lost. It was a doubleheader, and the Cubs lost both 
uh, both games. And uh, this was a Chicago bat boy named Frank McNally. And, uh, but he got um, him to put on the Chicago uniform and took a photograph of him and then later placed him in this photo, this, this montage. Um, but but uh, the, the model himself uh, famously said that, you know, it, it seemed like he, he worked for an hour with uh, Mr. Rockwell to get just the right downtrodden face look, you know. And so uh, really, again, that's artistic journalism that he, yes, it's depicting a game that happened, but uh, he's manipulating the players and the people and he's inserting, um, a, you know, a, a young lady who lived right down the street. She's the woman with her, her um, mouth open, you know, yep. he often used models that he knew uh, he would put place their faces in the crowd, you know, um, as devices for him to, to work with. And so, I mean, you know, look, uh, it's, it's much more interesting to paint a scrunched up face like uh, these three players have, you know, sitting against the back of the, of the dugout than it would be, you know, just to paint a smile on their face. So um, I think, that's one reason he's turned everything on its head here. You may agree or disagree, but I think the Bat Boy looks more depressed than anybody else, and he's not a player. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. He's the Bat well, Boy. And he was the Bat Boy for the other team. The other team, right. Right. Now, in the middle, we have the uh, manager, Charlie Grimm. His mm -hmm. expression is not so much of being depressed. He just looks frustrated and almost to the point of boredom like i've seen this before here we go again right uh so that's a that's a great uh way that rockwell has captured in there uh some of the other people featured um the pitcher uh, is off to the right that's a guy named uh johnny schmitz although he's partially obscured uh by the bat boy uh, the detail, though, again, is incredible. You see the towels, you see the glove that's hanging up on a nail. And then, as you mentioned, uh, the fans, in some ways, the fans are as well presented as the players. I mean, they're, oh, yes. they're featured. So this this contrast of, of emotion, that's typical of Rockwell's work. Yeah. Yeah, I really like this one. Um, it's, um, it, it is another iconic piece. And even though it does show uh, a team at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, this is part of the reality of baseball. Every team uh, is going to go through losses. Even the best teams will lose uh, 60 games a year. Uh, it's just going to happen. Of course, this team lost a lot more than that, 90 during the course of the 1948 season. Um, another great piece here, iconic as well, is a little bit later. This is from 1957. This is known simply as the rookie right. and a number of prominent Boston Red Sox, including the great Ted Williams shown here. That's right. I think that's one reason this one is um, as popular as it is uh, because, you know, recognizable figures like these um, wonderful players, um, you know, were a specialty also of, of Norman Rockwell. What do you think was the motivation here? We, we know the names of, of most of the players. There's Ted Williams. Uh, below him tying his shoe is Jackie Jensen, who was a very good outfielder. Lower left is a catcher, Sammy White. Um, and then on the extreme right is a backup infielder, Billy Goodman. So we know the identities of a lot of the players. We don't really know the rookie and we don't know the motivation. Was, was this a real life arrival of a player? What do you think made Rockwell um, want to do this? I'm not sure. He um, uh, he visited. Um, he loved to travel, and he would often travel in advance of in research uh, in advance of, of of painting a cover for the post. And um, so, in in this instance, he visited the training um, camp of um, of the Red Sox down in Sarasota, Florida. Hmm. and took pictures of the locker room there and uh so i don't know you know he might have he might have seen a, a scene of of a rookie coming in but uh, actually a lot of scholars think that the rookie that he's depicted 
uh, was uh, inspired by um, Mickey McDermott, who joined the Red Sox in 1948, and his image was published in Life magazine, and that that um, uh, Rockwell used that image for the face profile. Um, so, you know, though this is painted in 1957, it's not depicting his arrival necessarily, but it's just, it could be any rookie coming in. But I think in this instance, you know, I said before, Rockwell loved intimate uh, situations. And so he is taking you behind the scenes and into the locker room. And, um, and the other one we just saw in the dugout, you know, he's going where you'd like to go, um, but can't go. <laughs> yeah. And so he's taking you there. And uh, uh, I suspect that's probably um, the motivation behind it. Let me give you my interpretation, and then you can agree or disagree off of your own thoughts. But when I see the rookie, he's got this big smile. He's kind of this innocent, fresh-faced kid who is thrilled to be in a major league clubhouse, but he's very naive. He's very unsophisticated. His jacket doesn't fit him well. It's well up on his wrist. Ted Williams is looking at him like, who the heck are you? What do you want? What are you doing here? He's not necessarily getting a warm welcome, but yet he's got this big smile. He's just thrilled to be there, even though maybe they're not accepting him. Thoughts on that? Am, am I way off? Am no, I you're forced? not. You're not at all. You've perfectly described it. And I think what he's doing is something that um, he continued to do from this point forward uh, in depicting, um, you know, um, contrasts in emotions mm -hmm. and uh, just like we saw in the dugout with the, the happy screaming people above the dugout and the very morose people below it, it's somewhat similar here you know uh, sort of innocence versus um, jaded experience you know and uh, he, he, he loved to paint contrasting situations so that I think you could um, you know, you could identify with either one, you know, uh, who among us hasn't been in this, in both of those situations, you know, the new kid on the block or, uh, you know, in a job or a situation, a marriage or anything that's, uh, you know, got you down, you know, yeah. so. How about that, uh, that white suit? Was that, was that typical for young men to wear something like that in the 40s and 50s? Oh, sure it was. And he uses white, though, as a device to indicate innocence. He's slapping you right in the face with that. So when you said that, you got it, you hit it spot on. All right. Well, every once in a while, I'll come up with a good <laughs> one, I guess. Uh, here's a great one. One of my favorites, uh, one of the uh, great people among the Hall of Famers, fantastic third baseman, World Series hero, true gentleman, Brooks Robinson. Uh, this was done much later. This is 1971. We see Brooks signing for a fan in Baltimore at Memorial Stadium. And a particularly timely piece, it was done one year after Robinson's terrific one-man performance against the Cincinnati Reds. He made great play after great play at the hot corner. Uh, I'm curious, Stephen, was this one, was this commissioned by Brooks? Do you know uh, exactly? Because I don't think this was a Saturday Evening Post deal. It was not. This, this came from uh, some other motivation, correct? Right. He was um, often asked to com uh, to paint portraits of people, and he didn't like to do it. Um, he he liked to paint portraits, but only uh, from his own uh, motivation. So I suspect that he was a fan of Brooks Robinson and painted it as a result of that. I would never have thought that Brooks Robinson would have asked him to paint a portrait of himself. Uh, it's not in Brooks' character, I don't think. And it's not really how Rockwell worked. He, he um, would turn down uh, many, many commissions before he would take, an, take a portrait commission. And usually it had to be um, somebody who had, you know, characteristics that he wanted to explore and paint. And uh, so I suspect he painted this himself and and gave it to Brooks Robinson, which he often did. Yeah. Uh, this stayed in Brooks's collection until he recently, fairly recently, um, 
uh, you know, about five or six years ago, I think, uh, sold all of his um, baseball memorabilia to fund his charitable foundation. So right to the, um, to the end of his owning this, uh, you know, he was um, exhibiting his, his great character as a, as a baseball player. Yeah. Very interesting that he doesn't show Brooks, regarded by many as the greatest fielding third baseman of all time, does not <laughs> show him in the field, does not show him, you know, using his glove, no. his trademark. Right. shows him with a fan and I guess if you knew Brooks or no Brooks that maybe shouldn't be all that surprising because Brooks is always great with fans well there you go and indeed the the secondary title for this is really gee thanks Brooks really that's the title mm -hmm. yeah uh, I love the colors uh, I love the old Orioles uniform that they used back in the late 60s early 70s um, the, the wall uh, is interesting, uh, Memorial Stadium. They did have a lot of green at that old ballpark, which eventually gave way to uh, Camden Yards. Mm -hmm. Any significance at all to the two bats? Um, is that just a, just a detail? or is, That I haven't been able to figure out. Um, yeah. I, there's almost no detail that isn't there for a reason. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe it was something to – I have no idea. Maybe, did he win the – World Series on a, you know, uh, with a bat? I don't know. Uh, well, he was the MVP of the 70 World Series. Um, and he, uh, and he was known more for his fielding, but he had an outstanding uh, offensive series against the Reds in 1970. Uh, hit at least, I think, two home runs, uh, batted high average, and then made all these great plays. So, Well, that could know. very well be a reference to that. Then. Yeah. You know. What do you think about the detail of having the young fan who is getting his baseball signed and having him wear a matching Orioles cap? Oh, it's just, it's, uh, it's to show uh, how much young fans idolize their players, you know? And uh, I think in, in pairing them like that, he is showing the, you know, the, the, the importance of baseball in American uh, lore and in um, you know uh, the importance of, of the baseball player uh, to young kids you know and this relationship between it's not just a game you know and that that uh, they look up to players for uh, you know uh, as as idols and so he's connecting the two that very much in that way very skillfully done Right. We have three more pieces that we and want to. That's talk why about. the boy is wearing the the glove. By the way, I would yeah, think, you know, that's right. Yeah, yeah, he's got that that glove. He's ready to take that ball as soon as Brooks <laughs> has finished uh, signing it. Right. Uh, we do have three more pieces that we want to highlight, and these are all currently in the Norman Rockwell exhibit at Munson Williams Proctor. We're going to begin with uh, actually no. Before we get to uh, to those, we do have one other piece um, mm -hmm. that's not in the exhibit. Uh, and it's not a major league depiction like some of these others that we've been seeing. Here we have one that is called Choosing Up. It's 1951. Right. And it depicts uh, a group of boys, generic, unknown, who knows where they're from. And they're using an old way of choosing up sides by running their hands up the bat. Uh, whoever's hand is at the knob at the top will have the first uh, selection. Uh, I love this one, though, because uh, it, it does show non-celebrities. It shows some boys enjoying the national pastime. Right. They've got these ridiculously oversized pants that, you know, are about four sizes too big. I know players back then tended to wear blousier uniforms, but these kids are really carrying it <laughs> to an extreme. And uh, just the concentration on the bat and their hands. Right. I mean, they're really serious about this. Oh, yes. Uh, I think this picture is a little bit of a throwback because it does look back at the um, sort of uh, style that Rockwell used prior to the Second World War, you know, against a, a cream colored background. You could almost think that this was made for the Saturday Evening Post, but it wasn't. It was done for um, a calendar, the Brown and Bigelow 1951 Four Seasons calendar. Um, they published a calendar for 16 years, and uh, uh, Rockwell often 
uh, contributed images for it. And uh, this could have been an earlier image that he um, recycled for them uh, or just a brand new commission, but you know, in a nostalgic pose. I'm not, I don't know a whole lot and I don't think many of us uh, do know a whole lot about this picture. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's um, again, it's so very characteristic with, uh, you know, one of these sort of uh, uh, just interactions between four young boys, you know, um, that's very much Norm Rockwell's style. Stephen, would it be accurate to say that he was not obsessed with celebrity, that he seemed to enjoy doing pieces about unknown people, anonymous people, as much as someone who was famous? Oh, completely accurate, because um, in fact, he uh, really did not like painting celebrities. Um, that was almost always a function of being asked to do it by one of his employers. Uh, he would much rather have, he was well at home with an image like this one, and the ones that are coming up, as a matter of fact. Did he get um, negative feedback from celebrities that he depicted? Was that one of the reasons why he was reluctant to do famous people? Uh, not that I know of, no. Um, in fact, when Lyndon Johnson had his portrait painted by uh, an official uh, portrait painter for the White House, uh, when it was done, he, he famously said that he preferred the one that Norman Rockwell painted for of him really? for the Saturday Evening Post. <laughs> So, no, no, I think, uh, you know, people really liked his portraits because they were so honest and uh, uh, really captured every, you know, aspect of your personality. All right, let's get to some of the pieces that are featured in your exhibit currently at Munson Williams Proctor. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the first one, Fishing Trip. They'll be coming back next week. A right. very early piece from 1919. Tell us about these three boys. Do we have any sense of who they are? We know they're going on a fishing trip, but what more do we know beyond that? Well, um, <clears throat> they were three boys in his neighborhood that he wrangled to pose for this. Um, the one in the middle is uh, Cousin Reginald. And he, again, this is a nod to uh, um, sort of learning at the feet of master cartoonists. Uh, this idea of serialization and it was perfect for magazine covers because he could start um, a situation a theme uh, with something like this and uh, you know he, he's given you the backside of them first uh, you don't even see what their faces look like yet and so of course you're going to be waiting to see what happens when they come back you know and uh, so <clears throat> it was this kind of uh, methodology that really grabbed the public's attention. Uh, so there's cousin Reginald was the city cousin and he's visiting his country cousins. Mm. <clears throat> and so he's rich, he's uh, got his Orvis or uh, his new fly rod, you know, uh, his, his wicker basket, uh, his expensive clothes, he's a dandy. And uh, here are his country cousins and they're in rags with, uh, you know, sticks for poles, a tin can for worms, <coughs> and off they go. But Cousin Reginald is absolutely confident that with all of his expensive equipment, he's going to be the one to bring back the catch. Yeah. So do let's see know, what happens. Yeah. Do we know the names of the other two boys? Uh, I do think we know all of them. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I... I don't recall for uh, our lecture today, but, uh, but this is a very famous one, which yeah. uh, viewers could, could probably look up and find much more information about. But they were actual kids that he knew along with oh. Reginald, right? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Oh, and Reginald was not a real name. You know, he just pulled a boy uh, that he used as a model. Uh, he created, Reginald was a fictional character. Oh, okay. All right, here's the other part, the companion piece to this. <laughs> so this is what happens when they come back. We see the boys on either side looking pretty thrilled, pretty satisfied. Who and caught the Paul biggest Reg fish? Yeah, right. Paul Reginald doesn't look like he did that well. 
No, exactly. So that okay. is Norman Rockwell to a T. Uh, you know, he turns it on his head. Everything we've been talking about with the baseball pictures, he turns the situation on its head. He gives you the unconventional side of it. <clears throat> and uh, and he's drawn you in, you know, you 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 were rooting for the for the uh, the poor kids, you know, to begin with. And now, you know, look, they won. They got the big fish and all on their their stick poles. So and smarty pants, you know, got a tiny one. Yeah. So. Even though they're obviously from very different backgrounds and, and maybe don't have a lot in common and they've been successful and he hasn't coming back with the fish, they are all sticking together. They're not, it's not like they're separating from oh, him. They're yeah. left him behind. <clears throat> so there's still some unity there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, Rockwell's not in the business of, of painting bad endings. He almost always painted happy endings but uh you know uh there's still irony here you know there's still clever manipulation of the characters it's a story number one and look he's doing it he's in his early 20s you know and this is a device he carries on throughout his entire rest of his career now these two paintings uh they're on loan from the rockwell museum they are and two preparatory studies uh two drawings are also in the show that are uh, on loan from a private collector. So it's if you come to see them in person, it's a rare opportunity to see these wonderful works and his process. He started with a drawing first, and then he got to a painting. Hmm. And then ultimately, <clears throat> these were produced for um, The Country Gentleman, which was a, uh, a magazine at the time. So. The last piece is in many ways the most interesting, uh, and it is featured in the exhibit at Munson Williams Proctor. Again, the exhibit continues for another month until September 18th. This one is a later work. This is really toward the end of his life, 1967. He would die 11 years later. It is called New Kids in the Neighborhood. Uh, we see uh, two African-American children on the left, we see uh, three uh, white children on the right, along with their little pet dog. Uh, some folks are moving in. Uh, there's some furniture in the foreground. Uh, tell us more about, there's a lot going on here, Stephen, but give us a sense of exactly what's happening. Sure. Um, well, this is from his sort of the second blossoming of his career after he left the post and was now working for Look Magazine. <clears throat> and he really was depicting uh, various issues of the day. Um, prior to this, he had created a, a, a work called um, The Problem We All Live With, which, was, uh, which, which dealt with racial discrimination in schools um, and integration. And um, it had had um, enormous uh, appeal. Um, and so this, um, work occurs in 1967, a bit later. And here he is tackling the, um, the problem of uh, discrimination in housing and redlining in neighborhoods. And so uh, this he has depicted in a Chicago neighborhood of Park Forest. <clears throat> and he is depicting uh, the first black family to move into that neighborhood. And again, he's using his own artistic license to really highlight the issues involved. So, um, and again, he's turned it on its head. He's, he's given um, the African-American children there in their Sunday best, whereas uh, probably everyone else would have depicted them in poor clothes. Uh, and the white kids, they are in sort of tattered play clothes. Um, they're looking at each other with curiosity um, not having probably seen or known uh, kids of each of, of those different races at the time uh, because segregation was so intense. Um, the black kids have a white cat. The white kids have a black dog. Mm. Uh, and even the cat and the dog are curious about each other. Yeah. <clears throat> and so over all of this, um, there is this specter of 
fear of which he's created by it's very tough to see in this um powerpoint slide but way up at the corner in that second house in the middle there peering out the window is a white neighbor and that you know lent itself lent a, a sort of sense of fear and trepidation and anxiety over uh, in tone over this whole picture but what unifies them what do they all have a uh, baseball mitt and you have a sense that um, they'll be playing baseball soon together. And so Rockwell is, in his characteristic way, he's trying to give the viewer hope and optimism. He's bringing in you into this very difficult situation, not from the adult's perspective, but from the children's perspective. <clears throat> and he's giving us a way of trying to overcome the difficulties of what he's depicting. Mm. And I think that makes this such a powerful, poignant image. You know, you make a great point about the, the person in the background. And in, in a larger format, it's, it's a lot easier to see. But I guess he's kind of peering through the curtain, through the slit right. the curtains. Right. And has maybe somewhat of a suspicious look, I guess you could interpret Absolutely. it that way. Absolutely. Um, but the optimism does reign here. You really feel, and I think most viewers feel that, yeah, these two groups of kids, they're going to come together and baseball is going to help that. Right. Um, I love how the, the one kid on the right who's in a baseball uniform, he's really leaning over to kind of get a good look at them. Right. Um, and and I, I guess you could interpret that as, as he's open to consider this possible new uh, friendship. On the left, the boy and the girl, they're, they're very much uh, upright. Uh, they have fairly serious looks on their face. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's nothing in their, in their body language that indicates that they won't be willing to give these folks a try, right? Exactly. The, n no one's shying away from each other. Uh, they're just curious. And they, you know, they're seeing each other for the first time. And, uh, you know, it's a situation that, um, you know, could happen in other instances and in other, in other circumstances. And uh, so it's, there's a universal quality about it that um, rings true. And we all know that. And so here, Rockwell isn't shying away from it either. And he's really painting it as he saw it. And, <clears throat> you know, I really think that that using the device of, of and the motif of baseball um was probably you know this is 1967 uh you know it's it's probably um a way he saw he thought that you know people could come together and that that ultimately this was possible yeah you know? well the civil rights act had only been passed uh, a few years earlier uh, right. there was still segregation uh, right. There was certainly segregation at uh, minor league ballparks in the South, uh, persisting into the late 60s, really, right up until about 1970. Uh, so this was still very much a, a timely issue in many ways. And I guess one final point about this, even though this is Rockwell later in life, hasn't lost any of his skill as a painter, has he? No, no. It's filled with detail and luscious color and, um, you know, personality and uh, spirit and it, it's got everything and, and irony and uh, you know contrast it's it's got everything that Rockwell used throughout his career to tell a story this is one of just over uh, 50 original artworks currently featured at Munson Williams Proctor which is located about an hour from here in Cooperstown in Utica New York uh, the website for uh, the uh, the museum is mwpai.org, and those letters do stand for Munson Williams Proctor Arts Institute. So again, MWPAI. The exhibit, which opened in early June, will continue for another month until September 18th. Again, the guided tours are offered Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays at 1 p.m. Uh, in addition to the 50 or 50 plus original artworks that we have 
Also, we have uh, reproductions of the 323 uh, Saturday Evening Post covers uh, that he created as well. So that is all featured at Munson Williams Proctor. Uh, and as we get set to wrap things up, Stephen, uh, you told me before we went on that uh, so far the feedback to the exhibit has been very, very positive. Oh, indeed. Uh, we've had lots and lots of wonderful uh, comments from, from visitors, and I hope um, uh, visitors will continue to share their thoughts about the paintings and, uh, and about the exhibition. <clears throat> and we've had large numbers of, of people come and see the show. So um, don't, uh, don't wait too long if you've been putting it off to, to come and see the show, because in the final weeks, it does get a bit crowded, I think. But it's still worth it. I mean, goodness, uh, these are, are extraordinary uh, works of art that uh, aren't seen very often. And, um, and it's a, a great opportunity to do it here in the shadow of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah, not that far away. Not that uh, far. And, yeah, and for, for those who um, are not familiar with Munson Williams Proctor, uh, tell us a little bit about exactly where in Utica it is. It's so centrally located, I can't even tell you. Uh, you know, it's hard to get to. I mean, it's right off the throughway, about five minutes, um, and it's right on Genesee Street uh, in downtown Utica, the main thoroughfare, and you can't miss it. It's a great big gray granite cube, but uh, which doesn't look much on the outside, but inside it's filled with artistic treasures. And again, the website for those who would like to learn a little bit more about this exhibit, mwpai.org, uh, Munson Williams Proctor Art Institute in Utica, New York. Uh, it's been a terrific museum for many years. I used to live in the Utica area. I haven't been there in a while, but need to get back to see this exhibit uh, before it uh, closes down in the next uh, four weeks. Uh, Stephen, this has been great. I've learned a lot about Norman Rockwell and about some of these intricacies of the art world. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Bruce. Again, our guest, curator Stephen Harrison of Munson Williams Proctor in Utica, New York. The exhibit continuing until September 18th, highlighting the works of the legendary Norman Rockwell. We want to thank everybody for joining us today for this special edition of Virtual Voices of the Game. Hope you've enjoyed it. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.